Welcome to the Lightning Talks uh, on day three. <clears throat> um, yeah, the first thing we have today is uh, Russell O'Connor with um, off the road messaging. Russell? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Russell O'Connor. Um, I'm here to talk to you about um, off-the-record messaging, which is a, a cryptography plugin for uh, instant messengers. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that I didn't develop OTR, uh, uh, but unfortunately, the authors are in North America right now, and I'm here, so uh, I decided that someone ought to give a a little talk about OTR, so that's why I'm here. Uh, OTR was developed by Nikita Borisov, Ian Goldberg, and Eric Brewer. And uh, before going into what OTR does, uh, I want to explain the motivation and the problem uh, that OTR is trying to solve. Uh, suppose Alice and Bob are trying to uh, communicate over an instant messenger in a secure way, so they might plug in uh, some sort of PGP layer on top of their instant messaging system. And this will give you encryption and authentication, and this is something that most people here are familiar with. But um, suppose sometime in the future, Bob's computer is compromised in some way, whether by a backdoor or virus or a Trojan horse uh, and so forth, and uh, Bob's encryption keys are, are taken. Now, if the transcript of the instant message was recorded by somebody, and now they have access to Bob's decryption keys. Bob, uh, your, uh, uh, your Eve can uh, decrypt uh, these recorded transcripts and see what communications between Bob and Alice occurred in the past. And moreover, um, if uh, you're using a PGP to do digital signatures, uh, your adversary will be able to uh, read, uh, to have to be able to read the, uh, the digital signatures attached with it and verify that indeed Alice sent uh, these little messages over instant messenger. And uh, Alice will be having, have a hard time denying that uh, she said such and such a remark. So uh, this is bad and, uh, and being, not being able to de deny uh, what you said uh, on IM is even worse. This is n no longer like chatting with your buddy in a room. Right, uh, so if you use such a system, Alice had better be careful what she says over IM, because if Bob does something wrong, then uh, Alice could be in big trouble. So this is where OTR comes in. OTR stands for off the record. Uh, OTR, like uh, PGP, will provide encryption and authentication, but unlike PGP, uh, OTR also uh, gives you perfect forward secrecy and plausible deniability. Uh, so plausible deni deniability, I think, is the most important. Uh, and just quickly, uh, the way it works is that um, um, the digital signature of each, me each message is given its own digital signature and authenticated by using a shared secret between Alice and Bob. So when Bob verifies it, Bob knows that either Bob or Alice sent the message. And since Bob knows that he didn't send the message, he concludes that Alice must have sent the message. But if Bob wants to try to convince somebody else, that uh, say Charlie, that uh, Alice sent a message, all he can do uh, is convince Charlie that Bob or Alice sent the message, and Bob could have been uh, faking the whole thing. Uh, and uh, as a further security me measure in OTR, after the next uh, instant message is sent, uh, the shared secret is revealed. Uh, in, in the protocol, and now anyone can verify, or sorry, can fake the, uh, the digital signature, and, uh, and the digital signature becomes meaningless. And a new, message, uh, a new shared secret is created for the next message, and, uh, and so forth as you pass messages back and forth through IM. Uh, perfect forward secrecy is achieved by uh, using, again, a, a shared secret per message. Uh, this time, the shared secret will be an encryption key. And after Bob decrypts uh, his message, he throws away his encryption key. And now, if in the future, Bob or Alice's computer is compromised, uh, 
the encryption keys have been tossed away because they've already served their purpose of decrypting a, a single message. And uh, the transcript still can't be decrypted by, um, by, by Eve. Um, so these shared secrets are generated by a standard Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And the real-time online nature of instant messaging makes this uh, protocol work very well. Um, using OTR is, in my opinion, as easy as using SSH compared to Telnet. Uh, uh, I run OTR under the game client under Linux, and it, what the plugin does is make a little button that says not private when you're talking with somebody for the first time, and if you press that button, uh, it checks to see if the other person is running an OTR client, and if they are running an OTR client, a window pops up saying private connection established, and now the little button says private, and now you can start using your instant messages uh, you get encryption, you get authentication, you get plausible deniability, and you get perfect forward secrecy. OTR works on the text message level of the protocol, so it's not tied to any particular implementation of an instant messaging system. Uh, so in, in theory, it should be compatible with all uh, instant messengers. Uh, the current OTR software, uh, there's a plugin for the game instant messenger, and this is available as a Debian package, so it's very easy in to install. For Macintosh, um, I'm told there's an ADMX uh, uh, plugin or um, version of AD uh, a version of ADMX that has OTR installed, and also available as an OTR proxy, which uh, works with Trillion and other Mac OS X uh, instant messaging programs, and. Uh, the OTR system is open source, so if your favorite instant messenger is not included in this list, uh, it's very easy to, uh, uh, well, pretty easy to set up your own. Uh, uh, you can either develop your, develop your own plugin for your system or maybe pay somebody to uh, develop it for you. And I don't know how much time I have. It's, hold on. OK, so just the web page <laughs> is uh, cypherpunks.ca slash OTR. Or you can do a Google search for OTR, and if you ignore the old-time radio stuff, uh, number three or four is off-the-record messaging. Thank you. Talk number two is about uh, ZFS from Jens Kühnel. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I want to talk um, first. Is English okay? Because I wrote, wrote down German or English. Uh, wer versteht kein Englisch? No. Okay, good. Um, well, let's give this. I, I will give the talk in English. Um, it's about ZFS, the new uh, file system that uh, um, Sun shipped out with the Solaris uh, Express and Open Solaris uh, since a couple of months ago. I played around uh, on my uh, Sun for Fun project for about three days. And um, yeah, what's totally new is um, they s s uh, made really some nice changes uh, in, instead of the normal way um, file systems are used. Um, when you use dynamic file systems, you normally use LV LVM, where you have three layers. You start on the f first layer, you have your, your uh, block devices, then you have your, where you have your physical volumes, then you have your volume groups, and then you create logical volumes uh, and put the file system on it. Um, ZFS is uh, taking away one, one step and uh, cutting away uh, some slack you, you had before. And, and, and make it uh, a, lot, a lot easier. Um, you have your pool where you put your hard drives in, and uh, then you create directly on this pool your file systems. The advantage is uh, that you um, don't have to, uh, to take care about the 80% rule uh, of every file system, so please don't use the last 20% of a file system. Um, the simple way uh, to, to bypass is that the free space is shared with all file systems. At the first moment, it sounds a little bit strange, but you have quotas, so you can say, okay, this file system can only be this size, and, uh, but when it's totally filled, there is no fragmentation because the free space of the rest of the file system is still there. Um, 
some other problems uh, that are um, that have been um, yeah used or is uh, that um, you don't write really to blocks. The file system itself uh, is 100% um, atom uh, atomic. So uh, you really said, okay, I want to change this file and this changes I want to make. Uh, and it's not translated to um, a, a block layer where I said, okay, I change this block on my virtual, uh, uh, on my virtual file system, on, on, on my virtual hard drive that is shipped to three different uh, um, disks at the end, but the, the file system itself knows about the uh, underlying uh, uh, pool uh, disks and that you can uh, have a lot of more integrity checks and make sure that everything is done correctly because you're not uh, going, the file system knows about the underlying disks. Uh, another thing what, they, what they've done is um, it's 128-bit uh, file system, so that's the reason it's called ZFS. Um, it's set up by it. It's uh, the, uh, says on the slides uh, one uh, one information about you can store every quantum information on the Earth on the file system. So you, there is no limitation at all. Um, another very nice thing is uh, they put automatically a file system uh, um, a checksum in. Uh, every block that is written on the on the disks uh, has a checksum. And this checksum uh, is automatically created when the block is, is, is uh, stored. And then it's very easy to make a checksum because with mo no, modern, hard, uh, modern uh, CPUs, checksumming a block is, is quite a fast operation. And uh, it has advantage then that when one mirror is, is changed, it automatically detects it and can repair it. So uh, this information, this uh, checksum is inside the file system itself, not again like uh, on, on LVM or some other uh, RAID or uh, stuff where the, um, again, there's only for the block of the uh, underlying um, virtual fi uh, disk. Um, and um, this is, uh, again, a, pos a possibility to uh, detect uh, problems easier and in a better way. Another thing with ZFS, the block sizes are not fixed. So when the um, when ZFS detects that uh, a lot of uh, uh, big, huge uh, uh, chunks are read and write at the same time, automatically the the, um, the size will will uh, change. Especially useful of that when you're using uh, streaming. You have three clients using the same file and then it will automatically optimize for uh, with the read ahead buffers and stuff like that because the file system again knows about the, uh, uh, know that it's not one disk uh, which is then striped to, to, uh, to real physical disks but the file system knows about the, um, the file system, about the um, partitions. Your, um, your five minutes are over. Okay, uh, one thing is um, you can have a look um, at the Open Solaris website. There is a community about it, or you can uh, join the uh, Sun uh, Fun with Sun project. Uh, we have a Sun Enterprise uh, here to, to play around. If someone has ultra wide SCSI cable external, please, uh, I need to. <laughs> Thanks. Next one is a talk of. Christian Ten uh, about dying giraffe recordings. Good afternoon. My name is Christian Ten. I'm involved with dying giraffe recordings. If I talk to friends about this whole debacle on the Sony rootkit, you get three different reactions. First of all, people think, well, there is a rootkit possibly on my Windows machine, so what? They don't know what it is means they don't know what it implies. Then there are friends who say, so there's a rootkit for Windows machines that doesn't affect me. Although there seems to, there are rumors that there is a Sony rootkit for OS X2. And then there's a third reaction of people saying, you still buy CDs? <laughs> so, and they have a point. Why, do, why would you still buy music? Um, I have to admit, I download a lot too. In the Netherlands, where I come from, downloading is still legal. Uh, I have to, but on the other hand, I still buy a lot of vinyl. 
But why should I buy CDs? I, in Holland, I pay 20 euros for a CD, a mainstream CD. And that CD is protected, so I can't listen it to it on my iPod. Thanks to the protection, I can't listen it to on a DVD player, on a Mac, on a Linux machine, uh, on an MP3 car CD player, because protection kicks in. And you can uh, only listen to it on a regular audio CD player. And it's expensive, but of that 20 euros, hardly anything goes to the artist. Many mainstream artists get a contract where the label says um, you don't get any of the proceedings of your CD. You get your proceedings from your uh, tours, from your concerts, and CD sales is for promotion, for promotion of your music. Uh, many artists get into really bad contracts where um, they get some money but have to pay some money for marketing, distribution, and promotion and recording of their album. In uh, some ways, uh, millions, uh, artists who sold millions of CDs went bankrupt. Most of the music nowadays is mainstream crap because the major labels test the music with software if it's going to be a hit. And if it's not going to be a hit, they're not going to invest in it. So small niche uh, musicians do not have a chance with those labels. And then there's, of course, a DRM hell, with, which we've seen with uh, the Sony uh, debacle. And many me people just want the music. They don't want to have the medium because they listen on, it to the, on their iPod, on their media machines, on their servers. Uh, they don't want to pay for the marketing. They don't want to pay for uh, the uh, promotions of Britney Spears or a crappy local artists. They just want the music. So um, we decided to make our own record label called Dying Giraffe Recordings. Um, with our label, we try to make a system where, uh, the, where the system is fair for both the artists and the music lovers. So artists get a fair share of the proceedings, and our proceedings come from donations or CD sales. Um, artists keep all their rights over their own music. They can do with it what they want. If they want to relicense it, if they want to go to record, uh, under another record label, they can do that. But we ask them to make some of their tracks available under Creative Commons license. So some albums, some tracks are, uh, are available on our website as uh, freely downloadable MP3s, uh, Creative Commons licensed. Um, no DRMs and things like that. Um, there's free uh, podcasts and streams on our site, um, and in principle we would like to make it uh, available for radio to have tracks play for free. Uh, is, that's our way for um, promotion. And most of the recordings that we have are musicians which are not discovered. Some of them are actually pretty popular, uh, not very well known, but in their countries they are quite known. Uh, some of them are home or really low budget recordings. But there are so many advancements in the home recording technology that the quality of home recording is really vastly improving. Of course, it has some problems. Um, the labels and organizations, organizations are working against us. The organizations who uh, uh, control copyright, um, they find that what we are doing outside of their system is illegal or not done, and they're really working at, against us. We noticed it when we tried to press CDs a lot of CD manufacturing uh, companies refuse to work because, with us because we are not using the normal copyright licenses. We are not using, um, with in uh, the Netherlands it's Buma Semra, in uh, Germany it's uh, Ge uh, GEMA. We're trying to, we want to use a common creative license and then many of the uh, CD pressing agents refuse to work with us. The same with airplay. Um, if our tracks are played on the radio, we do not want our proceedings to go to the conventional uh, copyright agencies. And the agencies try to stop that too. Um, the same also with uh, the levy, which, is, uh, uh, which has to be paid if you buy an uh, empty CDR or DVDR. None of those proceedings go to us. Um, Christian, you have five minutes, Elba. All right. Um, <coughs> Well, um, let, let me conclude this. Check our uh, website. It's www.dyinggiraffe-recordings.com. You can reach me at christian at dyinggiraffe-recordings.com. Um, we're trying to set a network of 
people working together, uh, setting up their own shops, working with artists, <coughs> graphical artists, uh, engineers, um, to make this a fair system for both uh, artists and music lovers. So. Next is Peter Eisentraut with Open Source Databases for Data Mining. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Eisentraut, and I'm a developer in the PostgreSQL project, so I'm totally biased when it comes to database systems. And I wanted to squeeze in a quick talk into this Congress about databases, so I thought data mining is a popular topic these days. <clears throat> Not only in terms of the uh, social and political and ethical uh, issues that are being discussed all over here, but also if you look at the uh, development directions that open source database projects are now uh, taking these days. Um, for the last... 10 years, uh, um, open source database projects have mostly been dealing with uh, database-backed websites. So they have been dealing with getting records in and out and uh, getting updates processed as quickly as possible and dealing with concurrency issues and all that. And those problems are more or less solved nowadays or there's not a lot of development happening in this area. And if you look into the change logs or in the release notes of releases of PostgreSQL or MySQL in the last one or two years, direction is shifting now in, into, into uh, data mining or online analytical processing, if you, if you like to call that. That's almost the same thing. And that market has, until now, been uh, mostly dominated by expensive tool vendors, not only the well-known database vendors like Oracle or um, DB2, IBM. There's also a whole lot of other players who sell insanely expensive tools to uh, do data mining. And open source databases are readying themselves. They're not quite there yet, but they're moving into this uh, new direction now. Manifest, uh, this manifests itself in, in a lot of new features that you see in uh, open source database systems arriving. Dealing with, uh, for example, a table partitioning or database partitioning, so to spread your information on more machines if your database gets too large. Database federation goes kind of the other way logically. That's available in MySQL, for example. That you can connect databases sitting on different machines to one logical database, so you can deal with that. There's advanced scan types, for example, bitmap scans appear in PostgreSQL recently that you can use to process huge tables more efficiently or table uh, queries with a lot more uh, conditions. There's a lot of improvements being done in bulk loading, which is an uh, amazingly difficult problem, just getting your huge amounts of data into the database so you can process it. There's, it's a really hard problem. You can do incremental backups, for example. Until recently, you had to back up your entire database um, in, in on block, and now you can do that incrementally because you cannot back up one terabyte of data every night, obviously. And size limitations on, on tables and databases are being removed. Two days ago, um, Brent Winter talked in his talk uh, that um, they did a, collected all the packets at uh, access for all a Dutch ISP, and I think they needed 47 trillion CDs for that, and I calculated that last night. We cannot handle that quite yet, but you can imagine if uh, hard disk sizes continue <coughs> to grow, we can probably handle that in about uh, two or three uh, years. We are now dealing regularly with, with a terabyte databases already. Um, it's mostly limited by, by the, what the operating system or the hardware can handle, but databases are ready to handle that, uh, those uh, data sizes, actually. So SED is re uh, relatively small uh, compared to what a database can handle nowadays. So if you see that something, uh, that data retention according to EU, EU directive takes a couple of thousand or million CDs per day, that's actually not all that uh, much compared to what databases can handle. There's still a lot, lot lacking, a um, couple of features are lacking in, in most open source databases that I looked at, Cube and Rolla, for example. You can simulate that, but it has to be optimized. Recursion is still lacking. There's a lot of work still that need to be done in terms of parallelization. You can buy 16-way uh, CPU, uh, CPU machines, for example, and if you do data mining on that machine, you just use one CPU for one query, and so that still hinders progress. 
what's really lacking uh, right now is, is tools for data mining. You have database backends that can do data mining pretty efficiently, but there's not a lot of front-end tools to uh, actually help the users do that. And a lot of work needs to happen in, in, in that, in open, the open source era. Yeah. A lot of, uh, yeah, I'm almost finished. There's a, a couple of projects going on integrating what's already out there. For example, Jasper reports and, and loading tools are being integrated. For example, in the Postgres community, there's a, the Bizgres project, which integrates these tools to give you a data mining, mining package that you can download. But tool support is really lacking, but the database backends are there. So if you're interested in data mining, this is a great time to get involved. Or if you're interested in preventing data mining, this is also a great time to get involved <laughs> into open source database systems. So enjoy. Thanks. Next is a German lecture, um, Hacking the Law by Hübi. Ja, hallo zusammen. Es geht in meinem Vortrag darum, wie äh, kann man sehr kreativ äh, Gesetze anwenden, ähm, die normalerweise nicht benutzt werden. Also äh, ich ähm, habe vor einer Weile davor vor dem Problem gestanden, ich möchte gern mit Kismet und einem Notebook im Auto durch die Gegend fahren, also ganz normal Wardreifen machen und möchte das jetzt aber auf solide Füße stellen. Also wenn ich, nicht, wenn ich angehalten werde, dass ich halt eine, sagen wir mal, passende Ausrede habe. Das hat dann dazu geführt, dass ich, ich bin einfach mit dem fertig umgebauten Auto, das heißt, es war ein Spannungswander da, zwei große Rechner im Kofferraum und das Notebook auf dem Beifahrersitz und die Antennen auf dem Dach zum TÜV gefahren und habe gesagt, schönen guten Dach, das ist jetzt eine selbstfahrende Arbeitsmaschine. <lacht> Diese selbstfahrenden Arbeitsmaschinen äh, sind halt nicht Fahrzeuge wie ein Pkw oder ein Lkw, es ist eher eine Maschine, die zufälligerweise auch noch fahren kann. Also eher ein Arbeitsgerät, äh, bei dem es praktisch ist, dass es fährt. Der TÜV hat sich das dann angeguckt und äh, nach ein bisschen Aufklärung meinerseits, welche Gesetze denn jetzt nun verwendet werden, da gab es einen uralten Erlass aus dem Jahr 1972, wo genau diese Messwagen erklärt sind, äh, hat der TÜV-Prüfer sich das genauer angeguckt und festgestellt, ja, es ist genauso wie vorgeschrieben. Hat mir ein Gutachten darüber geschrieben, dass das Fahrzeug okay ist. Ich bin zur Zulassungsstelle gegangen, habe mir dann eine Betriebserlaubnis erteilen lassen und äh, Kennzeichen für das Fahrzeug zuteilen lassen. Das heißt, das ist jetzt ein alter Postgolf äh, mit grünen Kennzeichen, ganz offiziell nicht zugelassen, sondern er darf nur auf der Straße fahren, hat eine Betriebserlaubnis. Das war dann bei der ersten Polizeikontrolle, irgendwann Freitagnacht zum kurz nach elf, war das dann sehr interessant, als der Fahrzeugschein halt verlangt wurde und ich halt erklären musste, dass der, ja, beim endgültig Stilllegen dieses Fahrzeugs, denn der Golfer vorher als LKW zugelassen gewesen, eingezogen wurde und nicht mehr da ist, hat es dann noch für Verblüffung gesorgt. Und ähm, ein weiterer Vorteil ist, das habe ich mir vorher auch genau angeguckt, da dieses, äh, diese alten Dieselfahrzeuge inzwischen, also hat der Golf 600 Euro Steuern gekostet und auch so knapp 1000 Euro Versicherung im Jahr, ähm, war dann die Idee, äh, ich habe mir dann das Kfz-Steuergesetz angeguckt und habe festgestellt, dass zulassungsfreie Fahrzeuge, und dazu gehören halt diese Arbeitsmaschinen, nicht dem Steuergesetz unterliegen. Ja. Gut. <lacht> Also, äh, das Fahrzeug ist jetzt steuerfrei, kostet um die 300 Euro Versicherung im Jahr. Äh, und also es hat, wird, ist 1300 Euro billiger geworden. Ähm, und es ist wirklich so, dadurch, dass dieses Fahrzeug mal ein Dienstfahrzeug der Deutschen Bundespost war, ist es für die Kollegen mit den grün-weißen oder blau-weißen Autos immer noch ein dienstliches Fahrzeug. Also das ist, hat sich irgendwie so eingebrannt und dann ist klar, ja, das ist ein Messwagen, damit kann man messen. Ja, und dann die Frage, ja, was vermessen Sie denn? Ja, so Funknetzwerke wie zum Beispiel GSM, UMTS oder EGSM oder auch WLAN, sowas vermesse ich damit. Und, hm, ah ja, GSM, das ist bekannt, UMTS auch, Handy haben sie alle. Äh, damit war dann geklärt, was damit gemacht wird und... Äh, Gut, dann noch die Frage, ja, und für wen machen Sie das? Und dann, ja, für die Deutsche Post AG und für MCI zum Beispiel. 
Und äh, ah ja, okay, alles klar. Und damit war dann, ob ich da Wortreiben mache oder nicht, also das Wortreiben war halt einfach in Vermessen von Computernetzwerken verpackt, äh, war das dann plötzlich völlig normal und äh, funktioniert sehr gut übrigens. Ähm, also es hat bisher keine weiteren Probleme deshalb gegeben. Ähm, was weiter noch interessant ist, äh, ja, das... Äh, ja, das war es so eigentlich im Wesentlichen. Also. Ach so, äh, ganz kurz. Äh, ich habe mir gedacht, ich übertreibe es jetzt noch. Mal gucken, wann der Bogen bricht. Also man, er ist aber irgendwie nicht zu überspannen. Ich war dann beim Regierungspräsidium in Darmstadt, das ist das für mich Zuständige, und habe gefragt, wie es denn aussieht mit einer internationalen Falschpark- und Falschfahrgenehmigung. Also... <lacht> Also gleich mal, also zumindest europaweit, das würde mir ja reichen. <lacht> Und ähm, ja, das Echo da drauf war, ja, was machen Sie? Ja, so Computernetzwerke, so mit Funkzellen äh, vermessen, wo ich dann halt die Übergänge von den Funkzellen messen muss, halt wieder GSM, UMTS und sowas und WLAN. Und die sind halt da, wo viele Menschen sind, sind die halt sehr klein, weil die Funknetzwerke nicht so viel Kapazität haben und wir haben am meisten halt in den Innenstädten, da müsste ich halt öfters in den Fußgängerzonen fahren oder auch Waldwege und ich muss auch manchmal zum Neuausrichten von Richtantennen und Neueinrichten von Funkzellen halt auch einfach mal längere Zeit irgendwo parken und messen. Also einfach Dauermessungen machen. <lacht> <lacht> Also anders konnte ich es nicht umschreiben, dass ich sage, ich will Samstag früh halt in die Stadt fahren und einkaufen und direkt vom Laden <lacht> ähm, Ja, und es wurde dann sehr wohlwollend aufgenommen. Es gibt jetzt halt noch eine Sache, es wird etwas länger dauern, diesen Antrag zu bearbeiten. Äh, da die äh, Bund-Länder-Konferenz für die Straßenverkehrsordnung, denn die Straßenverkehrsordnung ist Ländersache, damit es aber bundesweit gilt, muss sich müssen sich alle Bundes äh, Landesverkehrsministerien damit beschäftigen. Äh, die müssen das halt noch absegnen und genehmigen und dann gilt es in der ganzen Bundesrepublik und auch gleichzeitig in den Staaten, wie zum Beispiel Frankreich, mit denen Übereinkommen äh, abgeschlossen worden, äh, dass solche Ausnahmen dann wechselseitig auch gelten. So, das war's. Next is Sam's locator, um, Java, uh, Geo uh, Java service. After all this uh, theoretical stuff, I have something to show that won't take long. Um, but I think I can manage it on here. So, boo, boo, boo. Okay, <laughs> first of all, I will switch off my email client so you don't read my emails. Well, mm, on my profession, I do something completely different, and um, I wanted to get into new technologies, so I started to um, practice some um, uh, Perl programming with Java, which, which was uh, completely new to me, except for the case I have um, a, a Java client, like many others of you probably uh, have as well. And I wanted to, to try out and mess around with the Google Maps API, um, uh, a hint. Uh, afterwards, at uh, uh, 17 hours, there is a uh, is a lecture of Mesh in in uh, lecture um, area three, I think, uh, where he explains the Google Maps API. So, and um, nowadays you um, <laughs> you you try to uh, connect everything to everything. So I try to connect uh, Java client to the Google Maps API. 
And uh, the purpose of this lecture is um, I want to show you what got out of it. And if you have uh, something similar, if you have anything, if, if you have a use, and I will wait for input afterwards. Uh, I'm around here. So, and I want to show it um, more or less live when we have We do have network, I think. Screen resolution. Mm. I'm terribly sorry. All systems fucked up. Oh, better. So, yeah, I wrote a small um, Java bot, which is called Locator, which runs on one of my uh, server. It's uh, on Shadi. And uh, when we are connected, we can talk to him. Please connect me, yes. So it's open, so to prove it. So he sits there and waits when, when you are subscribed. It's strong, really. uh, when you are subscribed, he takes oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All systems fucked up. Well, he takes orders and he sits and waits in the background and when you get connected and you have in your uh, status string, you have um, uh, some a, a string like this locator string, which uh, he is searching for, which starts with hash locator and then uh, geographical data like latitude and longitude. He takes it and he remembers it and um, I have some, some uh, made up some commands where you can see who, who is online and wh where they are. And the, the output is do -do -dum, do -do -dum. It's a small Google map. So you probably uh, so already saw Google Map, and uh, you know, uh, if you don't know, there's a small API which allows to make overlays on a on a uh, on a map on a um, which is mustn't be a map, which can also be a satellite image, which I use there, and uh, currently it's just one user online, <laughs> me, and. Um, well, I have marked up my my home and uh, the the Cologne um, the Cologne uh, uh, labor workshop of of the Cologne CCC, um, which is the upper left, and uh, this whole area is Cologne. There is no uh, tags on it to see it because Cologne isn't very uh, detailed in the map view of of uh, of Google Maps, and when you put uh, a marker in here and you click on it, you see who's online and it works with several users, although it's just made up and it's just one user there. Um, the next step is I want to plan to connect it to a GPS um, device on, on a serial um, uh, interface, take out automatically um, the, the geo position and um, pipe it into a small Perl script who transmitted? Uh, who wants to? Uh, who will transmit it to the to the Java bot locator and then shows it on on this um, on this map? So it's just a small exercise uh, to to get to know Google Map RP, to get to know the Java protocol in XML and so on. And uh, I think perhaps some uh, somebody has a small or bigger use for it to track some information. And I think 
perhaps uh, there could be it could be uh, a benefit for the community when you uh, put in your uh, uh, your your geo coordinates and uh, your your friends see where you are. So it must be automatically with a GPS device. So this can be manually if you know where you are, where you usually are, where your workplace is, where you live, and so on. And uh, yeah, that's it. And if you want to see it, uh, you, you see here the, the URL. <laughs> so probably the next days you see me where I am on this map. And you can, well, it's HTML. You can, you can the output uh, uh, side of this experiment you can see in the source code. And if, if you want to know the, um, uh, the uh, source code of the small Perl script of the Java bot, uh, perhaps to, to reuse it for your own purpose, for your own bot, you can mail me. I'm just using a, a net uh, Cohen Cohen Java library in Perl. So it isn't that uh, that hard. <clears throat> so my mail address, I just write it in in, in the URL uh, bar. Is so. If anyone has any use of it, notice it, contact me, and thank you. Next is Darkman. Um, this is talk about Simbra, a web-based um, email client with uh, Ajax. Hello, the microphone doesn't work. Yeah, don't touch me. Ah, it's okay. Um, first of all, uh, I wrote down, uh, I will talk in German, but um, I have a few uh, English listeners, so I will switch to English now. Um, okay, um, Simbra is an email collaboration suite. Um, it is um, based on Red Hat Linux actually. Um, <coughs> hmm? Okay, um, it is uh, based on Red Hat Linux actually um, because um, they uh, developed it for um, yeah, uh, mass rollout on, f on and some companies. Um, and actually, um, um, it, um, uh, it is uh, just uh, yeah, the web mailer. Um, you have an EMAP and an uh, SMTP front uh, backend, so you can use it with your normal uh, client, but uh, the most features are implemented on the web mailer. Um, so I will show a few features of it. Um, the login uh, I have passed already because the demo is sometimes a little bit slow um, and the network isn't the best at the moment. So um, this is the screen you see after the login. You have a normal in inbox. Um, as you can see um, here, um, okay, the inbox takes a little bit to load. Um, the inbox looks like a normal uh, client-like uh, Outlook. Um, you have the uh, support of some conversation tracking. Um, you can see the small uh, counters here, uh, which shows how many emails on this conversation already have been. Um, and the people um, who are uh, conversation together. You can see here uh, a f uh, one of the features. If you uh, go with your mouse on the uh, on one of the name, you can see the contact information you can store on the server um, and uh, use for your address book, uh, phone call, whatever. Um, so uh, if you open a, me a mail like this one, you can see a lot of other nice features. Um, the email will be passed. This is not an HTML email. It's plain text. Um, the email will be pass, uh, passed for some uh, things like uh, um, phone numbers, addresses, uh, or uh, even dates you have maybe uh, in your calendar. So, um, okay, cool. So we have just to wait a little bit. Um, um, there will be used a few regex uh, to recognize uh, things like uh, address. Um, 
if it will be uh, will be working again, you can see uh, um, that you have context sensitive uh, pop ups on this uh, after that um, because um, you can click on a uh, phone number and add it to your address book or directly Skype on it if you have Skype in installed. Um, or even um, if you have an, a date, you can see the, um, the uh, snapshot of your uh, today's calendar. So you can see um, if you say, okay, let's meet at uh, nine o'clock, um, if you have an, another date on it. So um, you can say, okay, this will, won't work without switching to the calendar view. Nah. Maybe it's working. Yeah, you can see it here. Um, this is one of the pop-ups I was mentioned. Um, you see the entry for 9 p.m. the lunch, um, and you can say, "Okay, I will be there or not." Um, then you have a phone number here, um, where you can click on it and it will start calling it. Uh, and the really cool feature is like this one, where you can see a map with the location uh, which was written in the email. So if you write an email, you can uh, you have the uh, normal uh, look like uh, another email client. You can write down email addresses. Uh, even if you uh, just type one word or one letter, it will look up your uh, contact uh, list and uh, complete email addresses for you without uh, knowing them completely. Um, so this is one of the features powered by Ajax in this case. Um, you also have, um, if you have written down some things and you see, oh, it's a new mail in my inbox and you click on the inbox because um, you want to look, um, the client recognize it and ask you to save. You can say no on this because you, we won't save it now. Um, you also have the possibility to switch to the calendar view which also has some nice features like just drag and drop uh, entries because um, it's normally hard if you have a date you want to enter the time and whatever so uh, in Zimbra you have just to click on the date and mark it and it will open an entry for you like this one okay so uh, and now you can see it in your calendar hopefully it will work now hello um, it's a little bit slow um, I don't know not this month. Oh, okay. I'm not okay. Um, my college called me. Uh, he will be an hour later, so we uh, have the meeting an hour later. You can. Great. Okay. So you can just hit and drag and drop it another time. And even uh, you can. Oops. It's hard because I can't see it on my monitor. Um, you also have a, a number, so you can take it here and move it to another day or maybe hour. Um, and so you can work uh, much more easier than with other uh, web-based clients like this. Okay. Um, yeah, it has. Also, uh, okay, uh, it has a lot of other features. Uh, maybe the online demo is mostly working. Um, if you want to try it, you have to use Red Hat Linux because it's an uh, uh, tar archive with um, all this stuff you need included. It includes also Postfix and Cyrus Emap and stuff. Um, because they uh, build it together with all these uh, programs. Um, but they're actually working on um, yeah, a standalone application you maybe uh, transfer on another uh, distribution. They also work on an uh, installer for Debian. Um, and uh, the actual releases have a lot of more features like searching, uh, a better searching uh, over your inbox or over your complete emails, including I searching inside of attachments, even if they are binary formats like Word documents, PDFs, or whatever. So um, it's cool features and it's a nice mailer. Maybe you may try it out a little bit or install it. Um, let's give it a try. Okay. <coughs> Next is Pi Exacnet, uh, Exacnet from Holger. That's supposed to work? Yeah. Just so, or? It is detecting the display, but I don't know if somebody has to switch it. Uh, Okay. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Can you concentrate a bit? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's uh, without the interactive thing, I cannot really do much. But the refresh rate is kind of lower. I mean, like, uh, yeah, but it's not so easy to execute. So maybe the next talk is ready, then I do it afterwards. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, first, okay, next talk. Um, Rafael Buonaventura, uh, Information Technology in a Peace Research Village in the Middle of Nowhere. So, my name is Rafael Buenaventura, and now for something completely different. I hope this works, because I have <laughs> Mac OS X68 running here. Yeah, it works perfectly on uh, IBM stuff. <laughs> Just a short note. Okay, I hope we can see something here as well. Yeah. Super secret. Okay. Um, so. Here we go. Okay, I'm, I'm coming from, I'm living in Portugal since about three years, and I'm working in the information technology field of a project that is called Tamera. Maybe you can. That is a peace research village or a peace research community in the middle of nowhere, as it was announced. That means uh, we are there since 10 years. The project exists there since 10 years. The whole project exists 30 years roundabout, uh, going all around the world. Uh, 134 hectares, that is 301 acres, with around about 100 people living there and 50 more people coming in 2006 as we start a new phase of the experiment. And uh, we are in a quite uh, off area of Portugal. It's the area with the, lo with the lowest infrastructural stuff. And so we decided from the very beginning to, to not connect us to the power grid and not connect us to the public water system. And or because the core issues of the project um, are creating a model for future living for a future without war, and the focus is on the social aspects. I'm just giving a short introduction to the project and then to the technology, technology aspect. So, basically, we are trying to build up a society based on trust and a new cultural lifestyle. And I may show you some pretty pictures Can you see? Okay, I think it's enough for just an impression to how it looks like there. And uh, this is kind of a plan of the whole area where you see different buildings. So, um, basically the idea is uh, to for 100 people to get together on a remote point and research uh, what culture or living 
in the future could be and what are the issues. And the idea is that um, a small project switches from one matrix, from the matrix of violence that we are living in a way, to the new matrix of, of peace, this according to um, chaos theory, quantum physics and uh, all that, this switch will take effect or will affect the whole world. I'm, this is also part of our studies there, so I can say you some things, I can say you a lot of things about that, how it, how it scientifically works. And one special thing is that we integrate or have the focus also on the issue of, uh, on the gender issue, on the issue of love, relationships, and sexuality in a new form or whatever it means. And the global networking of peace activists all around the world. And this is, it is intended as a base station and training station for act, peace activists um, worldwide in crisis areas. It's in a way in, in follow of one project that is called Biosphere 2. It was created in the 70s and the, in the 80s in Arizona in America that in fact um, failed because of the social aspect because after, I think, a few months, the people, the researchers living there could not see each other anymore because they were not able to solve the, the human issues there. Um, uh, although it was... Noch eine minute. Okay. So I come to the core point of my speech. <laughs> Networking in the middle of nowhere. So we have... Uh, the issues we have is power issues. We are working with conventional solar energy with generators and we are researching on new um, ways to work with non-conventional solar energy that is a model of an African village in a system with um, yeah like warm water generator and um, I can't remember the name right now internet access is a really big issue we are currently running a satellite system, bidirectional, and uh, networking. We are right now digging the whole earth and laying two kilometers of fiber optic cables to get the different offices uh, connected. New solutions for computing, that is mostly Linux-based thin clients, and switching all the notebooks that the workers come with that have, have Windows installed by default to switch them to Linux. Worldwide activities like um, network access for the activists in other countries, live video streaming, equipment for the activists, and so on. Um, ich muss and, leider hier echt abwürgen. Okay. Also, it is so, if you're interested in this project, come to me and speak to me. We are looking for people who want to get involved and support us. I will be around there if you're interested. Thank you. So I'm going to... That one? Thanks. I'm going to give a... Yes? Okay. No, it should be fine, so... So this is a quick talk about ad hoc networking. Um, the goal here is to implement a file server in five minutes without having installed uh, anything on the server side that we are communicating with. So first, a few words about distributing programs. If you do that, then you usually use something like CORBA or Java RMI or the SOAP model or something to actually have a part of your program on the server side and the other side on, on the client. And you have objects, you call methods, and you have to define interfaces. And I guess that some of you at least know that. And you also have to start something like a daemon, a server, and, and run something there, and it's, it's quite cumbersome. It also leads to, it morphs your program. It basically infects your program with object references, and suddenly half your program has to deal with remote method invocations because you want to have it very flexible uh, and evolving. So what you want of ad hoc networks actually is you want to have 
minimal ad hoc protocols that you just make up for your program to have something running on a different server and communicate uh, with that. You don't want to have this little thing that you want to implement uh, affect your whole program. And you want to have no installation required on the server side, basically. And you want to avoid maintaining interfaces, maintaining daemons, updating things remotely, and all this. So uh, PyExacNet does this. And basically, the only thing that you need is uh, SSH. And you need just a rough uh, Python uh, working on that server. And then you can uh, basically execute arbitrary code there. You can also use it for certain purposes if you like. Uh, it's a um, <coughs> interesting technology in that area. So let's just do that. We say that we want to have a gateway. This is only now uh, an SSH gateway on the, sorry, to a remote server. This is now built via an SSH connection. And we have that. And here we can just say, OK, I want to execute some arbitrary code on the other side. In this case, I'm just asking for the platform that this system is running on. I get back a channel object. And I, can, I, I send basically here, I send some information. And here I can just simply receive it. So it's an AMD64 platform here. And um, now we go for actually implementing a file server. So we take the same gateway. It's an open connection where you can, I can execute many threads there. And I say, OK, for each object that arrives in a channel, I just say I send the content of, I assume it's a file name, basically. The X is now a file name. Uh, I just read that, and the content is sent back. So this gives me now a channel again. So I can say, OK, um, give me the content of, well, what about the past WD file? Um, so I send the file name over, and I receive the content, right? So well, I can also, of course, split this, or well, just look at the first, I don't know, 20 characters, sorry. Oh, it's the root user, so you can walk from there and then see what's, what's on there. So this gateway is still the whole time there. You can just send code around, and the means um, how they communicate is the channel. Just send, receive, and it's not like just strings. You can have like lists and tuples and whatnot. And there's no installation required whatsoever on the server, except that you can SSH log into the server, and you have a Python, very rough, basic Python, Python install. So. Um, this is a slightly more advanced uh, file server where actually there's error handling integrated. So you have uh, you catch errors and you just return none so that the program doesn't crash. Because if you here send something that doesn't exist, um, then you will get some error. It actually transports the exception to your side. You can see, OK, this is actually on my client side. This is a remote error. And what was happening on the other side is an I.O. error. There is no such file directory. So this is the more advanced thing. It doesn't break. It just returns none. So you can have another try and, and look around in the file system. Of course, you can also something can do something like list dir and just send back the entries. And well, the, the main thing is that you define everything. This is like a complete program here. There's nothing hidden. There's no server you have to install, nothing. You just have this. And uh, for example, we also implemented, just for the fun of it, an rsync protocol, walking two directory hierarchies, synchronizing. And that's something like a 100-line script, completely defined compactly in one place, and working everywhere where you have SSH connection. And then, well, this is the next things, experiments we want to do there is uh, having uh, even more gateways and being able to have, uh, to have channels to um, Remote computers you don't have direct connections to, but through other computers. So you basically have some kind of mesh of network going there. And if you want to understand a bit about the um, details, then just go to CodespeakNetPy. And there is the, there's some descriptions about how this works. It's a very simple description. Also explains a bit on how it works internally. And really, the only thing you need to know is remote exec and the channel object, send-receive. It's very simple. 
Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, that's it.